The Corn School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. For Real Agriculture, I'm Kelvin Hepner, and on this episode of The Corn School, we've brought the gang together again. We've brought uh, Jeanette Goche of BASF and Jason Vogt of Field to Field Agronomy to uh, talk about the value of pre-emerge herbicides and what that means for corn. Someone we know, Jason, uh, refers to corn as a, a diva crop, that, and you got to give it what it wants, and that is uh, early weed-free growing per- period, long weed-free growing period. Can you tell us a bit about this, <laughs> a bit about this field, the history and of what's happened here this spring? Yeah, for sure. So, like you've said, uh, weed-free period for corn is very critical in the early stages, and so this particular field was planted to corn. And uh, what happened here was, in a lot of cases with guys, we wanted to get a pre-emergent on, but we weren't able to get the whole field uh, covered off. So the grower was caught w- with uh, uh, chased out by rain, got a number of their other fields covered off with pre-emergent, but this particular field only got part of it and then a few other fields that didn't receive it as well and with all the moisture that we have had it's helped these pre-emergence to work very effectively and so this was a great opportunity to look at and show the grower and talk about how important this pre-emerges are because we can see it here in the exact same field side by side treated versus non and it's pretty dramatic that offers more flexibility with that in-crop pass as well in terms of having that control already take place pre-emerge Exactly. So in this particular case, we went with a pre-emergent that just controls broadleaves only. And so obviously we, we expected uh, grasses to eventually show up. And so the fields that did receive a pre-emergent, um, this particular one, that's pretty much what was coming. Some wild oats, barnyard grass, foxtail, that sort of thing. And just in patches. So the rest of the field was clean. And we're talking like three to four weeks now where there's no broadleaf emergence happening. And so they're able to delay that spraying now for quite a bit longer versus the fields that didn't get it. We had to come in quite early. And it was still tough to get in early enough just because of all the wind and rain we've been dealing with. But uh, that gave us that flexibility that we didn't have to go back in for quite a while. Yeah, We were just walking some of the rows here and what did we see in terms of broadleafs? Basically just a volunteer soybean? Exactly, volunteer soybean. We expect that because you can use this particular uh, pre-emergent on soybeans as well. Yeah. So Jeanette, Jason just talked about uh, the challenges that we have seen as effective as pre-emerges have been, it has been a challenge to get them on as well this year with the wind and, and moisture, the frequent rainfall. What are our options in crop then in corn if we haven't been able to get that valuable pre-emerge on? So you definitely pegged me. I do have lots of sayings and something like peas. I like to say pre's for peas because you're so limited on your in-crop options. You kind of have to do it. Uh, For corn though, it's a really flexible crop. I know I've said it before, but you really have lots of options, which sometimes can be a bad thing. It's hard to narrow it down sometimes, Um, but there is, there's a lot of options. If you missed your pre, exactly, it's been a tough year. Um, There's definitely some good options for post-emerge, but there's also a lot of options in corn where your post-emerge can offer some residual as well which is really important for this crop because as we already mentioned it has that longer critical weed free period and really does not like to be crowded by weeds. So something that I thought was kind of neat this year if you haven't perused your crop protection guide uh, one of the changes they made to it was when you look at the tables uh, just ahead of the herbicide section um, they actually pulled out the pre's with residual Um, and then follow it up with the post. And they they didn't necessarily pull out which posts have residual, but um, you can go through obviously. And we know products like Atrex or Residua, for example, um, they all offer some residual that you can tank mix in with other products. Yeah, there's also a a stewardship angle to this as well in terms of maintaining effectiveness of these herbicides in the long term. Yeah. I always say that too. Corn is a great crop to to swap out what you might be using in other uh, in other crops. So, I, I guess you do have some residual options with Group Twos in corn as well. But for example, that's one place where if you're using Group Twos in a lot of other parts of your rotation, that's an easy one to swap out and into some of the other unique modes of action like Group Twenty Sevens, for example, which might not be offering that residual. Uh, but they do have a good weed spectrum. It's a unique mode of action. And then we can just tank mix them back in with something that uh, maybe does have residual if that's what you're looking for. All right. 
Jason, in terms of the how this field is looking right now, uh, the areas we can obviously see the line where there were some weeds that were growing before the in-crop application took place. Are you happy with how the in-crop uh, application where the pre-emerge didn't happen? Are you happy with how it's looking there? And, and what do you think will be the outcome in terms of as this crop moves towards its full yield potential? Yeah, I would say it worked out actually quite well. So despite, the, again, the rain and the wind and the, you know not super warm temperatures that we've had, um, the ability to tank mix a number of different products like Jeanette was talking about, we're able to get, get some really good control of some pretty big weeds. And so overall, I'm really happy with it. And what that will hopefully do, that in combination with probably still seeing some uh, residual effectiveness from the fields that did get it, uh, might be able to hold off another application of glyphosate, possibly, is what we're hoping for. But that'll depend on you know how quickly this crop will advance in relationship to you know rains and more weed flushes. Yeah. So right there, that is also part of that resistance uh, stewardship angle as well in terms of the benefit of this. Yep, exactly. So one thing that we're, we do is we're trying to put some group 14s and 15s together in front of the corn and leaving the dicamba for, with the, the ingenias or the extend max in the soybeans. We can go with a lighter rate of those products in front of corn if we wanted to. But we decided, you know, let's keep that just from the soybeans and use some other groups in front of corn. We don't want to overextend the dicamba because we know that that's next in line for possible resistance. And there's already resistance to that uh, chemistry in the province too, with kosher. So we want to try to minimize that as much as we can. All right. Well, thank you both for your time. The sun is shining and hopefully the corn is growing, maybe even outgrowing the weeds at this point. Thank you both. Awesome. Yeah, right. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.